of our church. Thank you for tuning in today. We pray that this teaching will completely change your life and encourage you in a way that will exceed your expectations. So sit back, relax, and get ready for the most amazing message you've ever heard in your life. God is a great father. He's a great God. And God, we want to honor you today, God. We remind ourselves of who you are. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, Lord. I worship you. You are here, moving in the midst. I worship you. I worship you. Will we call you? Way maker, miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Come on and sing it with me. Say, way maker, miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here. Touching every heart, I worship you, Lord. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, said you I worship you, Lord. I worship you. You are here, touching every life. Oh, I worship you, Lord. I worship you. We call you way maker, miracle work, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, we call you a way maker. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who, yes, say that is who you are. That is who you are. That is maker. God, you're the miracle worker, God. You keep working miracles in our lives, God. You never leave us. You don't forsake us. You always have your arms wide open for everything that we need, God. Hallelujah. So this morning, God, we lift our hands to give you honor. We lift our hands to give you praise, God. Right where we are, God, we know there's no time or distance in the spirit. So we give you honor and praise for this healing that is taking place right now, God. Hallelujah. Even when I don't feel it, you work. Never stop, never stop work. Never stop, never stop work. Even when I don't see it, you work. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. 
never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. Never stop, because you are way Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. You're so amazing and you're so powerful, God. I thank you right now, Lord, because you're in the midst of every single situation in our lives, God. I thank you right now, Lord, that in the midst of all the things that we could be going through, we have the audacity to continue to trust you. We have the audacity to continue to love you right now, Father. I thank you right now, Lord, for every single person that is tuned in, that is watching on the stream. I thank you right now, Lord, that whatever's going on with them right now, Father, if it's something that's even going on with their physically, I declare in the name of Jesus that they are healed. I thank you right now, Lord, that the message that you have given me, God, is one that touches them from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. I thank you it's one that encourages them. I thank you it's one that builds them up, Father. I thank you that it's one that causes self-reflection in the name of Jesus. I thank you right now, Lord, because you're so amazing, God. Hallelujah. We love you right now, Father. We praise your name right now, Father, because you're in the midst of every single thing that's going on in our lives. And we thank you right now, Father, because it's your spirit that lives on the inside of us, Father. I thank you right now, God, hallelujah, for every single thing, Father. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Touch our lives, God. Show us the things that we need to do, Father. We thank you right now, Lord, that you're raining your love on us. We thank you right now, Lord, that you're raining your joy on us, Father. We thank you right now, Lord, that in the, pla in the places where we feel like we can't get out, we thank you right now, Father, that you're providing a way of escape right now in the name of Jesus. I thank you right now, Lord. Hallelujah. I speak to every single place that's, that's from here all the way to the other side of the world, God, that's connected to this stream. I declare in the name of Jesus that people have a better relationship with you. I declare that people continue to seek you, Father. I, can, I declare that people continue to love you, Father, and I thank you right now, Lord, that they receive your love today. I thank you right now, Lord. Hallelujah. It's in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Just give God some praise. Hallelujah. Praise God because he's so amazing. Praise God because he's so masterful. Praise God because he loves you so much. Hallelujah. And there's nothing that you can do to earn his love. He already loves you. That's enough to praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Mm. God is so amazing. I want to take this time right now. Hallelujah. Glory to God to welcome you to the Bar Church. My name is 
Pastor Rob McNair, me and my wife, Chrislyn McNair, pastor this amazing and wonderful church. And we've been streaming for several weeks right now due to the, the, the pandemic that's going on in the world. And we're so thankful for you all just continuing to come and stream. We've seen people from all over the globe tap in and say how much they've been, they've been loving our messages. They've been loving everything that's been going on with us. And, and we're just, we're so excited that you guys are on the stream. So right now, what you want to do is we got moderators in the chat room right now. Let us know where you're from. Let us know, know what city you're from. I don't care what city it is. I don't care what state it is. I don't care what country it is. Let us know where you're from so we can actually connect with you. I would like to know, I would like to know you and, and, and how you found out about us. So, so let us know where you're coming from. Let us know we're, we're monitoring this thing right now. Chris is over in the chat room right now. If you guys want to say what's up to her, Chris has been doing some amazing prayer calls. If you guys don't know, like, a lot of y'all are watching are watching because you kind of like filtered over from her prayer calls on Monday morning. Listen, listen, listen. We're so thankful for you. We're so thankful that people are continuing to connect with this and we don't want to stop there. We want to continue to build and grow. We want to continue to teach this word with, with a great understanding. We want to be able to teach this word with love. We want to be able to reach those people who wouldn't even want to step foot into church. We want to be able to reach some of you right now. So this message right here is for you as well as it's for me. It's for everybody that's watching. This is a timely word and we're thankful. So, so, so thankful that you all have connected with us. Amen. I have a question to ask. You know, I'm always asking a question at the beginning of my message. And I want to ask you this, like, have you ever had a bad neighbor? I mean, a terrible, bad neighbor. We, we hear bad stories about, about neighbors all the time. Neighbors that, that do bad things to each other, like they argue over property lines and trees falling over on different properties and stuff like that. Some of you might have had that experience before. Some of you might actually be the bad neighbor, you know. But, but some of us have those neighbors that we pass by their house and they seem to like do things that just like bother us, like they, they don't cut their grass, you know, or, 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 or they do something they, like they have music cut out, cut up way too loud. The other night, it was like 10 o'clock at night and I was just laying my son down to sleep. And as I was laying him down to sleep, one of my neighbors decided they wanted to shoot some fireworks. And so he jumped up afraid and I had to wait 30 or 45 minutes until my neighbor stopped shooting fireworks. They weren't supposed to be doing it that late anyway and it wasn't even a holiday until I could actually put my son down. I was frustrated. I was like, what kind of, what kind of neighbor are you not to be considerate about the noise that you're making? I was one of those, I, I was really just really tripping like, man, what kind of neighbor is that? You know, I could be a bad neighbor. I, I don't know, there's this guy across the street from me, um, not directly across the street, but a couple of houses up. Every time I wave at him, he just doesn't wave. You know, and I, I try to say, hey, how you doing? And he just doesn't seem to acknowledge you. I don't, I don't know if there's anything I did or, or anything like that. My wife actually went up to their house several months ago because they had a yard sale. And she said, like, they seem like pretty cool people. But for some reason, whenever I step out my, outside of my house and I see him and I try to wave, he doesn't say anything. And I'm like, what kind of neighbor are you that, that doesn't say anything? I think, I think his favorite color is camo because all he wears all day long is just army fatigues. Every time I see him, he's camo from top to bottom, unless he's a professional hunter or something like that. I don't know. But I'm just trying to figure out, am I a bad neighbor to him? Or, 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 or why is he being a bad neighbor towards me? We all got the neighbors, you know, when, when we're staying in an apartment, you got the neighbors that stay above you. It seems like they don't never go to sleep, right? Two or three o'clock in the morning, you hear a bunch of pity patting on the floor trying to figure out, okay, what's going on? Why are you guys running around, man? I'm trying to get some sleep. Or we got the neighbor that, that stays down the hallway from us that always cooks the food that doesn't really smell that good. And we're just trying to figure out why am I always next to the, next to the person that, that just doesn't seem to be so considerate. They don't seem like they're a good neighbor. And so there's always these situations, and I believe God places us in these situations because we have to learn to work together. We have to learn to do things uh, cohesively. So I want you to think right now, like, do you have any bad neighbors or are you a bad neighbor? But I also want you to ask you this. If something was to happen at your home, which neighbors will come help you out? If somebody was to break into your house and they saw the person across the street, what would they do? If you saw somebody breaking into your neighbor's house or if your neighbor's house caught on fire, what would you do? 
See, we're in a place in a society right now where we don't like dealing with our neighbors. We're in a place in society right now because of the way people look that we don't like how they look, so therefore we feel like we don't need to, we don't, we don't need to co co collaborate with them because they, they don't seem to fit our values, they don't seem to fit who we are. But if we're always living in this place that's, that's separate, then why are we living in a neighborhood together? You understand what I'm saying? If we want to be so separate, then maybe we need to move to a place where we're not included or assimilated with so many different people. Glory to God. So I want to ask you something. Are you a good neighbor or a bad one? I'm going to read a couple of scriptures right now, and I think you need to put yourself in the middle of it and try to figure out, are you that good neighbor or are you that bad neighbor? Luke 10 and 25, the Passion Translation, Jesus finished uh, teaching his disciples, and there's a religious leader that stands up, a scholar or a lawyer, depending on the translation you're looking at, that's standing up. He wants to ask Jesus a question. He asked him this. He said, um, teacher, what requirement must I fulfill if I want to live forever in heaven? So he's a scholar. He's a guy that's, that, that's, 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 that knows scripture. So he says, you know, what, what do I need to do to live to forever in heaven? And Jesus replied, well, what does Moses teach us? He said, what do you read in the law? And the religious scholar answered and said, it states you must love the Lord God with all your heart, all your passion, all your energy, and your every thought. And you must love your neighbor as well as you love yourself. And Jesus said, well, that's correct. Now go and do exactly that and you will live. So, so many times we point things to God like, like, man, I love God. God is so amazing and, and I love him and I love him and I love him. We're always doing that. I love him, I love him, I love him type thing, right? So I'm sure he was sitting here. He was like, had his notes or whatever. He said, okay, so let me see if I match this up because I'm a student of the law. I'm, I'm a student. So, so let me see if I get this right. So, so Moses said that I need to love the Lord, uh, my God, with all my heart, all my passion, all my energy and my every thought. Cool, I got that. I love God. You don't love God? What's wrong with you, Right? So, so he's at that point where he's like, man, I, I love God, so I'm, I'm good. I got that part, Jesus, okay? And then he says, well, well, you must love your neighbor as well as you love yourself. And so he probably kind of might maybe even skipped over the neighbor part, and he said, well, I know I love myself. I know I love myself. See, I, 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 I love myself. I love looking at myself in the mirror every day. You know what I'm saying? I know I'm clean. I know I got my polo on. You know what I'm saying? I got my fresh 270s on. You know, I, I know I love myself, so I know I'm good. You know what I'm saying? I, I remember it's so funny because back in the early 2000s, Usher had a song called, on, called uh, You Don't Have to Call On. And I had just broke up with my girlfriend, like, like, and we had been together for like two or three years. And I was really miserable when, you know, this was my first like real major breakup or whatever. And that song came out. And I remember one day, like I was just sitting, sitting on my couch and I heard that song, You Don't Have to Call, Come On by Usher. And I was like, no, nah, you ain't got to call me. I'm going to be all right. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to go out. I'm going to hit up my homeboys or whatever. We're going to go out and we're going to have a good time because I love myself. And literally every time that song came on, I was like, man, 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 I'm getting over that girl. Man, I'm good. Man, I'm straight. Man, the girl, the, the girl that don't mean nothing, I'm good, you know? And, and it, was, it was a way that I had to understand that I had value in myself, right? So I didn't have no problem loving myself. So I say, okay, cool. So, so, so he says, cool, I love myself. I love God. Cool. But I guarantee when he started thinking about his neighbor, he wasn't so confident. Because verse number 29, he says, wanting to justify himself. He questioned Jesus further, saying, so what do you mean by my neighbor? You, you, you know, like, like when you say neighbor, Jesus, like, who qualifies for that? I mean, the dude down the street, like, oh, yeah, 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 he cool. Oh, yeah, that dude over there, yeah, like, like he's, he's cool, too. Yeah, yeah. You know, I live next to, uh, it's funny, my, my, the dynamics of my neighborhood is funny. I live next to the cat lady. And the cat lady, I mean, sometimes we'll see as much as like nine, ten cats out there. Cats come all over in our yard. Every time I come outside and prepare to get in the car, I see cats all on my car. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like, oh my God, we gotta do something with all these cats, right? But like, like she's a cool lady though. So I can I can love the cat lady, even though, you know, I, maybe the scat cats need to quit scratching up my car, but I, I can love the cat lady. But what about that neighbor though that you don't like? 
What about that person that you don't get along with? You know, that neighbor that you argued about the property lines with? Or not even a person that lives next to you. What about the person that you cut off or maybe cut you off on the highway and shot you a bird? Can you love them? What about that person on the job that you know, that you know, like the day they get fired is going to be the best day of your life? Can you love them? What about the people who you don't even know? Like I said, the, the neighbor across the street from me, like, 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 I don't know what it is that he may not like about me for him not to, not to, to, to wave or not to say anything to me. Like, like, can I love that? Can I love a person like that? And so I think one of the things that the guy was trying to say is like, man, I can love God easily. I could love myself easily, but unless you define this whole neighbor thing, I don't even know. I don't even know. Because you can't possibly mean that person that, 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 that gets on my nerves. You can't possibly mean that person that I continue to bicker back and forth with. Can, do you? Jesus, do you? And Jesus replied this. He said, listen, and I'll tell you. There was once a Jewish man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho when bandits robbed him along the way. That's in verse 30. They beat him severely. They stripped him naked and they left this man half dead. Verse 31 says, soon a Jewish priest walking down the same road came upon the wounded man and seeing him from a distance, the priest crossed over to the other side of the road and walked right past him, not turning to help him one bit. And later, a religious man, a, a, a Levite, came walking down the same road and likewise crossed over to the other side to pass by the wounded man without stopping for him. And finally, another man, a Samaritan, came upon the bleeding man and was moved with tender compassion. He stooped down and he gave him first aid. Pouring olive oil on his wounds, he disinfected them with wine and bandaged them to stop the bleeding. He stopped what he was doing to tend to this man. He lifted him up. He placed him on his own donkey and brought him to an inn, a, a, a hotel, a place where the guy could rest. Then he took him from his donkey and he carried him into a room for the night. And the next morning he took his own money. So wait a minute. So wait a minute. Then, so he stayed with him the entire night and watched over him. And the next morning, he took his own money from his wallet and went to the innkeeper and gave him these words. He said, so now tell me, uh, he said, um, let me go back, let me go back. The next morning, he said, take care of him until I come back from my journey. If it costs more than this, then I'll repay you when I return. So then Jesus says to the guy, so now tell me which one of these three men who saw the wounded man proved to be a true neighbor? The religious scholar responded, the one who demonstrated kindness and mercy. And Jesus said, you must go and do the same as he. <laughs> so let's read this again so we can break it down to get an understanding. A Jewish man was beat up and robbed. A Jewish man was beat up and robbed in his own city. A Jewish man was beat up and robbed. And a Jewish priest, a Jewish priest walking down the same road came upon him. And the scripture said, he said, seeing him from a distance. I believe that's important because basically the priest saw him from a distance and, and made the actual determination that that's none of my business. He made the actual determination, I'm just going to stay out of that. And he then proceeded to turn and walk across the street and walk by the wounded guy, not seeing if he was okay, to get to his destination. What's the excuse? What is the excuse 
Like I, 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 I kind of trip out because this guy's a, a, a Jewish priest. This is, this is almost the same equivalent of me right now as a pastor for me to be able to see somebody hurting and abused and bleeding that's on the side of the road and making a predetermination that I don't want to get involved with whatever's going on with them, so I'm going to go around them. That's right now, the, the, there's no excuse not to help a hurting person. What's the, what's the, what is the excuse we could have as pastors and leaders and Christians not to lament with another person and show compassion? Not to see another person hurting and it draw on us so much to be able to help this person. It, you know, some, it's like, like, like we want to say, well, what about this or what about that? Now, what about nothing? What about the fact that I see somebody hurting? I'm not moved by compassion. I don't have the idea to, to, to lament with that person. Like, like, like sometimes we have to try to figure out and consider what's going on. But compassion, it, it considers the humanity. Compassion com considers the humanity of a person, not what they got going on. We can even think about, about, about what Jesus, everywhere Jesus healed or most places where Jesus healed, the scripture said that he was moved with compassion and then lives were changed. Lives and change and people were healed because, because Jesus moved straight to a point where their humanity was magnified. A couple years ago, Chris and I, we, we, we do counseling from time to time just to make, you know, marriage maintenance to make sure everything is good. And so um, we were kind of at a, we were kind of at a bad place. So we went to counseling and uh, there was a specific situation that continued to come up between she and I, and she was, uh, she was hurt by it. And she was hurt by it, but me, I was explaining to her that, you know what, it's really not that bad, it's good, trying to encourage her and all these different things. And the, the counselor stopped me and she said, wait, she said, wait, you may be right in this, you may approve all your points, but the only thing she wants you to do right now is to lament with her. She doesn't want to hear any excuse. She doesn't want to hear any reasoning behind it. The only she wants you thing you wants, she wants you to do is to have compassion for her. And where are we at a moment where we do not lament with other human beings? Where are we at a moment where we can see a guy who, 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 who was murdered by a police officer and instead of lamenting with the man's family, we decide we want to bring up how he had drugs in his system. We decide we want to bring up his, his record from years ago instead of lamenting and seeing that. I challenge every single pastor, every single leader that is sitting and in, in, in watching this, how is it that we have the audacity not to lament when we see another person pass away? Not to lament and say, you know what, I don't know what to do, but I'm just here for you. How do we have the audacity? I kind of get frustrated because... Lately, we've been at a place where, where, where I was looking at social media the other day and a well-known pastor or some well-known known pastors retweeted or re-pictured, we, we put up this post with a police officer crying with this long post about all the things that the police officer did, how he helped people out of car accidents and how he did this and how he did that. I get that. I understand all police officers aren't bad, but this is not the time. This is the time where you lament with your hurting brother. This is the time where you see your black brothers and sisters who continuously go through these situations day in and day out. This is the time you lament and you say, hey, listen, I'm here for you. You may not even know what to do. That's cool. But the audacity for some of us to, to, to point out, well, look what this person's going through. You're not even... There's a doggone whole book called Lamentations in the Bible. Like, we, we get this place where we lack compassion, where we lack looking at people as humans and we want to put people in categories. The idea for us to love our neighbor, the idea for Jesus talking about this parable is not for us to be like this Jewish priest and see something from a distance and decide, I don't want to deal with it. Man, lament, it grieves me 
when I see other leaders trying to point out other things. It grieves me when I see people quoting the news more than they're quoting the Bible. It grieves me. People that, that, that are my friends, people that I identify with, people that, that we teach the same thing. I challenge you, have compassion for humanity. <laughs> you can't shame anybody who passed away. What? Where's the humanity in that? They deserve to die? Really? Hmm. So how do you value life? How do you value life? You value life enough to go and say that we shouldn't have abortions, but you don't value life enough to help the lady that decides the child to, to, to raise and keep the child. Some of us are so focused on the one thing that we don't see to the left and the right. And we have no human element whatsoever. <sighs> Number two, the second person that came along was a religious man. A religious man, a, a, man of, a man of the law. They came walking down the road and likewise crossed over to the other side. The same doggone thing. This man, they say he's a religious man, he was a Levite, so that means he knew the law. And he knew the law so much, he was like, I'm not gonna get involved in that. I got a place to go. But it was the third person. The third person that came by, which was so interesting because the third person <laughs> was somebody that wasn't even of the same race as the Jewish person. This, the third person was somebody who was, a, who was from Samaria. Somebody who was a, of a different race actually came by and saw this traveler hurting, bleeding, had been beaten and left for dead. And he stopped where he was going because his humanity and his love for humanity rose up to be able to hurt his hurting, hurting brother. See, we look at it from a standpoint of, so, so uh, <laughs> I'll put it this way. The, 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 the lady at the well, the lady at the well was, uh, was a, a Samaritan woman. And you guys have to look, I don't remember the exact scripture. I, I'll, I'll see if maybe somebody can put it, put it up there. But the lady at the well, she, she said something to Jesus when she was at the well. She was like, how is it basically that you're Jewish and I'm Samaritan? Like you shouldn't even be talking to me. This is a place where these two types of people, these two races of people had been, had been beefing for hundreds or thousands of years. So there was no reason. That's just like a blood going to help a crib. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's just like, <clears throat> that's, that's major beef going on. But yet in the midst of that, the Samaritan stopped and saw this Jewish man, saw this, this human race brother beaten. And what did he do? Like I said, his humanity rose above his belief. Ladies and gentlemen, when one person hurts, we all hurt. Or at least we all should. <laughs> we all should hurt when we see another person that's anguishing in pain. We all should hurt when we see that there's somebody of another race that is going through something. You shouldn't be like, I don't care. I mean, we believe, believe in Jesus. If we believe in Jesus, then why are we sitting here trying to dictate who we should love and who we shouldn't love when Jesus said we should love everybody? We're like that scholar. Now, who exactly is my neighbor who I should love? It grieves me. It grieves me to no end how we cause separatism, how we're victims of separatism. 
understand. <laughs> I have I have some really great friends that are white. And they are really lamenting and they're really trying to see what are happening, what's happening and trying to see how they can help. But I have some people who I thought were friends that who haven't said a word. And that's hurtful. Because for your five minutes of discomfort, that will never equate to the 400 years that black people have suffered. So no, I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty. But take the moment to have compassion. Take the moment to lament with us as we try to get through this together. Take the moment to see where there is wrong. I see some pastors, I can literally see they don't even know what to do. They, they're going back and forth. One post means this, next post means that, because they're trying to bring a balance. When all they have to say is, I'm trying to have compassion for somebody who's hurting. I know, I, know some, I know some amazing police officers. I know probably about seven, eight, nine, ten police officers. There's some great police officers. I know all police officers ain't bad, but this ain't the time to bring it up. As a matter of fact, me being who I am, shoot, the only police officers that I trust are the ones that I know. I go down the street. I went to the store the other day. I had a headlight out. Was I going to make it home? If that's not your reality, then you don't understand. But understand that's my reality. <laughs> Four things the Samaritan did to be the good neighbor. To be the good neighbor. Number one, he stopped what he was doing and where he was going. And sometimes we're so quick to point the people to Jesus, we neglect to pay attention to where they are. People don't want to hear about Jesus until we understand where they are. People don't want to, that's just like when we go to these sports games and we see these folks hanging around with all these picket signs talking about you going to hell and all these different things. Nobody want to hear that. First of all, those people aren't pointing people to Jesus. I don't know who they're pointing to, but that's, that's not the love of God, first of all. But the whole idea is that you don't even know my situation. You don't even know anything about me, yet you're trying to point me to something. You know, I have no idea who I am. And so we have, we have something so powerful. They say, Gandhi said it. I don't know who said it. They said, Gandhi said that, that I like your Christ, but I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Christ being moved with compassion. Christ being the one that every time he was moved with compassion was able to lay hands on the sick and they, they recovered. Christ being the one to see people for who they are. Christ being the one that didn't even require people to change. The only people he got frustrated at was the Pharisees, the ones he knew who, who, who were trying to use the law and abuse the law and knew the law and was trying to uh, uh, judge everybody else. Them were the people that Jesus didn't get along with. If we're supposed to be like Jesus, where's the compassion? Where's the love for our neighbors? Where's the love for the person that's fallen? Like I said, step one, he stopped what he was doing and where he was going. The Samaritan had a place where he was going. He had a direction that he was following, just like the priest, just like the Levite. But he had the audacity to say, you know what? I need to stop and I need to help this person. I need to stop where I'm going and I need to address the situation. Number two, he gave him first aid. <laughs> Oftentimes people are talking about healing, healing the nation, healing the nation. There needs to be a healing in the nation. Yeah, there needs to be a healing in the nation after you dress my wounds. After you address the issues that I have. I got a cousin who broke his leg. And instead of going to the doctor, he just, he just never went to the doctor. And his, his bone healed, but his bone didn't heal back correctly, so he walks with a limp. 
How can we talk about healing the nation or talk about healing when we haven't given first aid to the broken areas? There are broken areas in this nation. There are broken areas amongst us, one another, that we can't even communicate with each other without feeling like we're being personally attacked. We need to be able to address the areas, address the broken areas. That's the only way we'll ever be able to heal properly or else we're forever going to be limping because we're trying to, we're trying to, heal something without fixing the issue. You can, you can have a wound that's infected. You can put a Band-Aid on a wound without cleaning it out and it's going to get worse and it's going to spread unless you address the issue. There are some issues in our community that need to be addressed. But we're too beat up. We're too hurting. And we need somebody else to be able to do it. A lot of people say that we don't need white people to, to help, to help the situation. But I say if it's broken and they have the ability to be able to fix it, then they should be the ones to help fix it. Living separate isn't gonna work. Trying to build up things on your own isn't gonna work. As a matter of fact, <laughs> It was funny because one of, one, of, one of my white friends, he was the first person that said that we're the ones who broke it and we're the ones who need to fix it. <laughs> if we're ever going to heal right, the ones that broke it need to fix it. Number three, he lifted up the one that was hurting. The scripture said he lifted him up and he carried him. When you're lifting someone up and you're carrying them, they're too weak to move. And we're assuming the responsibility that I have to carry myself and I have to carry that person that is hurting. So in the midst of me trying to get somewhere to a destination, I'm carrying somebody. I can't complain. I can't talk about my feet hurt. I can't talk about I'm tired. No, I'm lifting up my brother. I got you. And we're going to a destination together. And then not only are we going to this destination together, I'm going to make sure that you're healed. I'm going to make sure that you're dressed. I'm going to, I'm going to watch over you and I'm going to make sure that everything is going to be okay. The Bible said that he stayed. The Samaritan stayed with the Jewish man until the next morning. And I'm sure he was doing that to make sure that he was okay. A lot of my friends ask me, well, what should I do? What should I, and I say, lift us up, man. Lift us up. Don't tear us down. Lift, lift us up. Figure out how you, can, how you can help carry me. Figure how you can, how you can, how you can help out in that way. <laughs> the last thing, the last thing, it's to see things through. The good neighbor, the good Samaritan, saw things through, meaning that he took care of the bill. He went to the innkeeper and was like, he's going to stay two more nights. And if he needs anything else, I'll be back and I'll take care of it. See us through. Don't just post a hashtag and think that means anything. Don't just post a black picture and think that means anything. Don't just say black lives matter and think that really means anything. Yeah, that's cool. But we need to link up. We need to, uh, we need to get together and we need to have conversations. A lot of people are even bad about conversations. Conver conversations when follow through have some great expectations and have some great results. But we need to have more than conversations. We need to have follow through and we need to have good results. We need to dig in together, follow through and do what you can to follow through. I challenge everybody right now because this, is, this isn't even really about, this isn't really about race. 
I mean, it is. I mean, we could we could pull out the fact that it was a Jewish and a Samaritan and and how two people of of opposing races, you know, got together like we could talk about that. But then we can also talk about the Jewish and the Levite who were of the same race of the guy who was beaten and downtrodden. It's about loving your neighbor. And right now we're so tense that we don't even want to love our neighbor. When all commonality and all understanding is this, the idea that Jesus Christ gave his life to save us from our sin, everybody needs Jesus. Everybody on every corner of this world needs Jesus. And we got to point people back to him. But in the midst of pointing people back to him, we got to be able to look at each other and we got to be able to love each other because if we don't love each other and I don't mean love each other when it's convenient but if we don't love each other then what's the point of pointing people to Jesus there is none father I thank you for this message today I thank you for everything that I was able to relay that you have placed on my heart God I thank you that you're doing with it what, what you will in everybody's heart, that we have a close examination of ourselves, God, that every single person that is connected to the stream, instead of pointing fingers and looking the other way, has a close examination of themselves and what you have called them to do and you who you have called them to be as a good neighbor. I thank you right now, Lord. I thank you that you're bringing healing, I thank you that you're bringing the right people in place to to help with the healing. I thank you, God, right now, because you're so amazing and you're so, you're so, you're the the master strategist. And I thank you, you have given us strategies and wisdom. I thank you right now, Lord. I thank you right now, Father. Father, right now, as there's so much tension and turmoil going on in this country and in this world. I thank you right now, Lord, that everything that's bubbling over comes to an end. I thank you right now, Lord, that we see an end to racism, this sin that continues to plague us even as a country. I thank you right now, Father, that each one of us does a self-examination and seeing how what we can do to make things better. I thank you right now, Lord, for you giving my white brothers and sisters the opportunity not just to even lament with us, but to give us ideas and strategies. I thank you right now, Lord, that we can stand in solidarity with one another, not just at times where we see heinous crimes happen, God, but every single day, Father, that we stand and we really see each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, as you have called us to be. Thank you right now, Father. Thank you right now, Father. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I pray, I pray you all enjoyed this message. I pray this was something that was really, um, really self-reflecting for each and every one of you. I pray that this is something that you can take with you to your families, that you can share with your family and friends, and you can just talk about this and discuss. This is something that's not going to end today. It's not going to end tomorrow. But if we continue to work work this out y'all then we will see some positive results we've seen some positive results all around the country i'm getting myself plugged in with all different types of community leaders all across the community just so we can see that when things happen that there needs to be reform in a lot of different areas that there needs to be change in a lot of different areas i'm getting involved with a lot of racial reconciliation when it comes to our church because sunday morning is the most divided time for people Sunday morning is the most, the most segregated time of the week because we like to go in our own places. We don't, we don't like to congregate and all of that needs to stop. We need to be able to love one another. We need to be able to grow together. We need to be able to help each other. We need to be able to have compassion for each other. We need to be able to lament with each other. And then we need to be able to build with each other. There's a lot of things that's going on, a lot of ideas that that, 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 that I've, I've really been researching and trying to figure out where do we start. We gotta start with educating ourselves. A couple weeks ago, I put up a, a picture of, 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 um, of a recent rendering of what Jesus looked like. 
And I didn't put it because I, I was tr wondering if I should put it or not, but understand that even in that recent rendering, it's probably about two or three shades lighter because Jesus was probably a little bit closer to my complexion. But people still don't want to don't want to address that. People still don't want to address that in our children's books when we talk about the Bible that every single character in those books are white. People still don't even want to <laughs> address that the, when we talk about the Egyptians. <laughs> Every single character that we talk about the Egyptians, they're all white, even though Egypt is in Africa. There's a major wrongness that's going on. <clears throat> when I was growing up, I didn't care about what people looked like. Kids don't care about that. But what ends up happening is somewhere along the way, we're taught something from somebody and that experience it mars us for life. I grew up, my first few years in, in, in uh, elementary school, I was the only black person in my class. I remember the comments. I remember the, the picking on. I remember me not knowing who I was. I, I had my best friend, he was white, his name is Chris. Chris, I wonder where he is. But I'm gonna tell you, Chris had a spike he had a whole bunch of moose and he had a spike in his hair and his, his hair would stick straight up. And I asked my mom, I said, can I get my hair to do that? She was like, no, you can't. And I was so hurt because I just wanted to be like my friend. And it was those things that I started to learn that there was differences between he and I. And those things that we always got along with, his parents and my parents, cool, everybody was always getting along. But I would just wonder sometimes, like, why don't I ever see people like me? And it was hurtful. And I'm not the only one dealing with this. So I don't mean to belabor a point. I don't mean to have a message about racism and everything every single week. We don't mean to do that at all. But some things need to be brought to the forefront. Lastly, I... um. <sighs> I was, you know, I spent a considerable amount of time on social media, probably more than I should as of recent. And um, there was a guy that I never met him before. I reached out to him years ago. He was pastoring a church down in uh, Little Five Points at, um, I think it was at the Seven Stages, Five Stages or whatever. Um, they would have service in. And uh, I wanted to get down there. This is before we started our church. I wanted to get down there. Never got a chance to get down there. He ended up moving to Florida. And I reached out to him every once in a while. And he's a white guy, and he had a, a forum between him and several of his friends, like four or five other black guys, him and another white guy, and, and they were having talks and communications. And this is, this is important because you never know how people look at you. You never know what you say or how people, how it influences people. And he began to talk about, like he listed out everything that he and his friend talked about with timestamps and everything. And on the timestamp, I was looking and I saw my name on this timestamp. And apparently he brought my name up in this, in this communication, just talking about a church and the things that we do. And, and I realized, like, man, like, you never know who's looking at you. You never know who's listening or paying attention. Somebody I'd never met, never seen face to face, literally had a conversation about us and our church and the things that we're doing. And even in the midst of today's uh, temperament of the, uh, the environment that we're in, for him to say, you know what? And then he, I, I said, man, you know, thanks, I appreciate it or whatever. And he was like, man, I'm listening. That meant the world to me. Because he gets it. <laughs> he gets it. And he's just saying, I'm just a listening ear. I can't fix it right now. I can do my best, but right now I'm listening. So I thank you all so much. Um, I want to give everybody an opportunity to sow into this message, to sow into this ministry. We continue to do things and help change lives, and we continue to help things going. And, and this is all because of your support and everything that you do for this ministry, every seed that you sow. Uh, we've been doing some amazing things around here in the building and, 
and you know when you guys come back uh, I'm thinking about doing something on the floors and just thinking about doing some different things so when people come in like like you guys you know I, I, I'm, I'm so thankful for everybody that continues to sow into this ministry all of our partners everybody that's recently partnered with us thank you so much if you want to partner with us go ahead and type partner in the screen below if you want to become a member go ahead and type member in the screen below because I guarantee you listen we're on the way up we're we're doing some amazing things and trust me trust me man when we get back in here man we're gonna have so much fun and we're gonna grow together and we're gonna love each other so just pray about what it is God will have you to give you can do a cash app dollar sign the bar church a lot of people don't want to do it that's cool you can go to the website what is the bar.com but ask God what he would have you to give don't just say, well, I'm just going to give 5 or $10 or something like that. No, ask God. Find out. Find out. Just say, God, what is it? And just whatever you feel like he's saying, go ahead and give that. But we thank you and we love you. And it's in Jesus' name that we are here today and will continue to be here until he returns. Y'all have a good one. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to the Bar Church broadcast. If this message was a blessing to you, please click that share button and share it with all of your friends and family. Also, if God has put it on your heart to sow a seed into the Bar Church, the information on ways to give are listed below. We pray increase and continuous increase over you and your family for your seed. Also, don't forget to follow us on Instagram at the Bar Church, Facebook, The Bar Church, and you can find further information about us at www.whatisthebar.com. It has been in our hearts to start a unique ministry, reaching those who wouldn't normally feel as if they fit in a traditional church setting. Our ministry welcomes imperfect people from all walks of life. We're not just pastoring the church, but we're restoring communities. We believe that serving people is what sharing the love of Jesus is all about. By teaching people the true gospel of God's unwavering grace, we desire to see all people saved and their God-given authority restored. However, while we have a great desire to spread this message, we need prayers and financial support to help us do so. Partnership is several people joining together to accomplish a task or meet a need that is greater than what they could do on their own. So we believe that if a thousand people will donate $10 a month or more, we can further reach this world for Jesus in a major way. There's no specific dollar amount necessary. However, we ask that you pray about what God would have you to give. We would consider it an honor to partner with you in this vision of teaching and spreading the authentic love of Jesus in America and around the world. We believe that each message the Lord has entrusted us to deliver will change the way people perceive God. However, it doesn't matter how important the message is or how well we deliver it because until the message is sent, no one will hear it. And partnership makes this delivery possible. Your gift will help in places that you may be physically unable to visit rebuilding communities, providing shelter and resources for single mothers, sponsoring children and getting an advanced education, and most importantly, spreading the gospel. And these are just a few of the missions we aim to conquer to make, when la last, to make a lasting mark within the world. When you partner with The Bar, you get monthly newsletters about the progress of The Bar and the community, work we are currently involved in, special seating during all conferences and events, MP3 downloads of messages, special discounts on products, me and Rock continuously praying for you, and most importantly, a front row seat to the restoration of thousands of souls. And if you want to help, please seek God for a specific amount to donate monthly. It only takes a few minutes to sign up to get on board with the Bar Church today. Chris and I love you, we appreciate you, and thank you so much for your support.